Hello, space fans. Welcome to another edition of Space Fan News. The week before Christmas doesn't usually boast a lot of new astronomy discoveries, but I did want to bring your attention to a couple of important news items that has happened this month. First up, engineers and scientists building Hubble's successor, the James Webb Space Telescope, have begun the important phase of installing the mirror segments on the objective backplane. As of this week, seven of the 18 mirror segments have been installed on the structure, and together, all of them will become the main primary mirror of the Space Telescope, measuring a whopping six and a half meters across. This will make the light collecting area of JWST a factor seven larger than Hubble, whose primary is only 2.4 meters. Now, for those living under an astronomical rock or not following Space Fan News, the James Webb Space Telescope is the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope and is currently scheduled for launch in October 2014. It will live in some special orbital real estate known as the L2 point, a spot a million and a half kilometers from Earth and follows us along as we travel around the Sun. Starting next year, I'll be beginning a new vlog series entitled Countdown to JWST to make sure you are given all the latest news and science from the JWST mission, so please look for that. Carol Christian and I are also putting together a new audio podcast called This Week in Space Telescopes, where you can also get news updates, so look for that in mid-January. Next, have you ever wondered how big a black hole can get? Astronomers have known for some time that there are supermassive black holes at the centers of most galaxies. The one at the center of the Milky Way, for example, is estimated to be about 4 million times the mass of our Sun. But is there a limit to how big they can get? Astronomers at the University of Leicester in the UK have released a study estimating that the upper limit of how large black holes can get is around 50 billion, with a B, solar masses. An important thing that needs to exist for black holes to grow is the accretion disk. This is the material that swirls around the black hole just prior to falling in. This disk is important for the black hole's growth and is the primary food for black holes, but they're unstable and prone to dissipating into nearby stars. These disks also provide us with the primary means of seeing them by observing the huge amounts of radiation given off by the gas as it falls in. Once these disks are gone, though, the black hole can't grow anymore. So, since the disk is the important thing, they calculated how big a black hole would have to be for its outer edge to keep a disk from forming. And the answer turned out to be 50 billion solar masses. Anything larger, and the disk is too unstable. <laughs> now, that's still pretty freaking big. Of course, they can, in principle, get bigger through merging with other black holes, but no light would be produced in this merger, and the bigger merged black hole could not have a disk of gas that could make any light, so we couldn't see it easily. We'd have to turn to gravitational lensing effects for that. It can also get bigger if a star falls straight into it. Again, we wouldn't see any disk, though. Now, I'll admit, though, reading this story kind of confused me. On the one hand, they're saying the biggest a black hole can get is 50 billion solar masses because there is no sustainable disk feeding the black hole, making it bigger. And I get that. I do. But then they say mergers can make them bigger still, we just can't see it because there is no disk. But just because we can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Wait a minute. Unless you're the ravenous bug bladder beast of trawl. Which, now that I think of it, may actually apply to black holes. They are ravenous. <laughs> Look it up. So, there's nothing really stopping a black hole larger than 50 billion solar masses from forming, so long as you don't rely on the disk to feed it. It gets bigger only through mergers after that point. Now, maybe that's too rare to really even consider. I don't know. Still, though, I think this study should have been titled, How Big Can Black Holes That We Can See Get? <laughs> okay, so normally this time of year is pretty slow when it comes to astronomy discoveries and news. So, what I want to do this week now is to show my appreciation for all of the Patreon patrons who have given financial support and to thank all space fans everywhere for your kind encouragement to this humble series on YouTube. So to that end, I've made you some astronomy video Christmas cards highlighting some of the more festive images that have been released this year by space and ground telescopes around the world. In the constellation Orion, and located some 1,350 light years away, is an object known as a Herbig Harrow Jet. 
In the center of this image, taken from a series of observations from the Hubble Space Telescope, partially obscured by a dark cloak of dust, a newborn star shoots twin jets out into space as a sort of birth announcement to the universe. These jets are formed when gas from a surrounding disk rains down onto the dust-obscured protostar and engorges it. The material is superheated and shoots outward from the star in opposite directions along an uncluttered escape route, the star's rotation axis. These narrow energetic beams are blasting across space at over 160,000 kilometers per hour. Of all the constellations in our night sky, perhaps none is more conspicuous than Orion. Northern Hemisphere dwellers usually begin seeing it in late October, and it continues gracing our celestial backyard until spring. Here, in March 2015, we see Orion the Hunter watching over Alma, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, high in the Chilean Andes. The famous Orion Nebula sits in the center of the image, a huge cauldron of new stars. This bright object is home to hundreds of brand new stars nurtured here. Off to the right, the bright supergiant star Betelgeuse. Unlike the stars in the Orion Nebula, this star is dying. Likely to become a supernova in about a hundred thousand years, it will become one of the brightest objects in our sky, second only to the full moon. Not long before the dawn of recorded human history, our distant ancestors would have witnessed what appeared to be a bright new star briefly blazing in the northern sky, rivaling the glow of our moon. It was the titanic detonation of a giant star much more massive than our sun. Now, thousands of years later, the expanding remnant of that blast can be seen as the Cygnus Loop a donut-shaped nebula that is six times the apparent diameter of the full moon. The Hubble Space Telescope was used to zoom into a small portion of that remnant called the Veil Nebula. Hubble resolves tangled, rope-like filaments of glowing gases. Supernovae enrich space with heavier elements used in the formation of future stars, planets, and life. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed that. This year marked another amazing one for astronomy. We truly live in the golden age of astronomy. We are looking at the universe with more telescopes and in more wavelengths than ever before, and we've only just gotten started. Next year promises to be even more exciting. Well, that's it for this week, Space fans. I hope you all have a great Christmas, and I'll be back next week with another episode where I'll present what I think were the five or ten, I haven't decided yet, depends on how much time I have, most important astronomy news stories for 2015, and we'll look forward to what's coming in 2016. Till then, as always, keep looking up.